Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth in our series of webinars. Today, we are very pleased to have Nick Deacon Elliott here from Boxfish. We also have Josh Moore and Kieran Howard from Net Control, who will be here to help out with questions. Nick is the CEO of Boxfish and is here to give you a look at the cybersecurity landscape, cyber awareness, and phishing simulation training for education. Welcome, Nick. It's great to have you here today. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining and thank you for uh, the session, EduGeek and Net Control. Delighted to get us going. OK, cool. So firstly, um, quick intro to myself. So I'm Nick Deacon, CEO and one of the founders of a cybersecurity company called um, Boxfish. Um, we focus on the human human element of cybersecurity. Big um Big vertical for us is the education sector, specifically in the UK, a little bit in mainland Europe and North America, but but largely um, in, in the UK. And we're going to talk today relatively practically about what we can be doing as IT leaders, business leaders, to reduce the risk um, of, of cyber attack on our organisation by empowering our individuals and our end users to, to do the right thing. So I'm just going to caveat slightly. Um, I moved house yesterday this is the first video i've caught video call i've ever done so i'm hoping uh, virgin media promised me 500 megabyte but i'm hoping we stand we stand the test so um if i disappear i'm coming back um okay so the the five things we're going to be looking at is setting the scene so what are we seeing out there um in the landscape what kind of attacks are we seeing what are we seeing um targeting our end users our, our multi-academy trust our schools um what can we do to kind of reduce that risk? So, so we work with, and it's not going to be a sales pitch, but about 400,000 end users a month, um, hundreds of schools uh, in the UK. And we have a methodology that we work through to reduce and mitigate that risk. So what have we learned over the years of doing this? What kind of assets and contents available, um, you know, in terms of tooling to help solve the problem? And I think a really big thing as well is what about the students? It's very easy to think of our end users as staff, back office, teachers, but we have a huge asset um, and portion of our technology landscape is the students. So what can we be doing to make sure they're playing their part to keep us safe? <clears throat> okay, so final slide on, on Boxfish before we jump in. So, you know, we, we do speak with credibility. We've been doing this for five years. We don't have a huge portfolio of product. We do one thing, and it's all centered around empowering end users to spot and identify those risks, um, report them, react in the right way. We do it with lots of different organizations, but, but largely public sector and edu. Um, so I'm hoping the things that we're going to talk about today really add some value and, and certainly resonate with the audience. OK, so I'm going to start off. It might feel a little bit doom and gloom to begin with, but but I need to set the scene. So we're going to look at some stats and, and then go into some attack types. So first and foremost, I think we've got to look at the volume. So there was a little perception, I think, a few years ago in edu, and it's definitely changing, but are we a target, you know? And, and now it's kind of a case of, well, well, everyone's certainly a target, but yes, absolutely, schools are being targeted and picked off um, on a more regular basis than, than ever before. So 83% um, of schools in the last 12 months have experienced at least one cyber incident. So um, there's different severities, of course, we've got things that, shut the entire school down and mean that we can't you know operate for weeks but then there's also there might be siloed microsoft account takeover so the long and short of it is that the volumes there severity will will range um but yes there is a real life problem that we have to have to be accountable for and, and solve now 71 percent of um schools um have suffered attack through the malware download. So what that's telling us is that, you know, malware and, and particularly malware delivered via, via phishing is really, um, really rife at the moment in edu. So anything that we do when we talk about the people, the empowerment, the training, the running simulated cyber attacks, we've got to be looking at where the threats are coming from and making sure that we're prioritizing those. So I think that's a really useful start. And then this last one for me, this, this is probably the, the piece that winds me up the most personally is that is that cyber criminals, people that you know we're trying to keep at bay, they will go after student work. They will, you know, we do see peaks and troughs of risk in the year. So, you know, with a business, relatively speaking, there's a like a 
um, a flat line of risk. But with a school, you've got, you know, exam results days going into, um, which is obviously probably the biggest risk period in terms of the, the emotion and, and, um, and potential fallout with both staff and parents. We then see kind of peaks and troughs through term time. So we go, you know, quieter over the summer period until results days and massive peaks and troughs. So cyber criminals aren't, aren't stupid. They're aware that there's more emotion and nervousness and general kind of, um, uh, I suppose, urgency around making sure everything's safe and running sound on these exam days and they will tra try and strike at those events so we've got to make sure that in our prep to those days that we are doing the right things which i'm going to come on to um shortly um and what, when i'm running these kind of conversations which we do quite regularly i always like to have a quick look at the headlines just before i jump in because it's all going well me showing a load of you know articles that are from 2019 2018 or whatever but but i don't think it hits home in the in the way that these will so these um, 17th of January, so I don't know what's the date today, 25th. So last week, an article, front page of the BBC, three quarters of schools hit by cyber attacks, talks about an audit, which I'm going to come on to in a moment. Um, this is a real problem in today that we're talking about. This isn't something we're trying to unpack from two, three years ago or predicting in the future. It's happening now. And I think, you know, if we look at, just go on BBC and type in cyber attack school, there's going to be loads of um example so it is something that we need to be very conscious of um that, that that's that's happening right now and there was a um an audit run and i imagine some people in the audience were maybe part of this audit actually and i think this is really a, a good place to start so um last year um the ncsc ran in partnership with 800 about 800 schools um in the uk kind of a, a an audit and, and findings report looking at the preparedness of schools for a cyber attack, how prepared they felt, what measures they had in place, um, what kind of attack types they were seeing, um, had they been successful, if so, what kind of data was picked up, etc. Um, and there's three or four summary findings from that that I think really helped set the scene for, for, for the rest of the presentation. And it's all edu focused this as well. So 75% of the schools in the 800, so um, uh, quick maths, about 650 or so, um, had at least um, one incident last year. Again, severity is really the key here, but 7% of those reported a significant disruption. And a significant disruption can be one of a few things, but at its worst case, it could be it could be school shut. You know, we can't teach, we can't access our systems, we're sending children home. And you know, there's ma you, you hear stories of kind of parents crying in the car parks. Um, students not being able to access the work, teachers in uh, you know utter chaos because you know essentially the school is shut while we recover the network. Um, so massive, massive disruption felt, and and you know a reasonable proportion are starting to see more significant ones. What we generally see is that there's a link between sophistication and kind of the out, output um, in terms of disruption. And I'm going to come on to why it's important that we don't just think these are mass phishing emails. Um, that you know somebody's paying um, or paying a small amount to a you know a company that they've never heard of. Often these are very sophisticated. They can lie dormant in your network and strike when when the time's right. So we're going to kind of unpack a little bit around um, the sophistication of these and, wh and why it's important. We we really educate our end users on the right kind of attacks. Um, 18% experience periods where staff had no access to important information. So. You know, the ability for your end users, teachers, uh, for example, to go and actually, you know, access learning material, build out lessons, mark homework. Schools are becoming massively dependent on technology, even from, you know, I'm 30, 34. And I remember in the early days of my school career, like, you know, there was just no computers. It was all overhead projectors and things. But now when we go and do these site visits, everything is tech driven. And it's great, it's a huge enabler, but the risk it poses is that everything is tech driven. So if there's problems, we really, you know, we're really dependent on it. What I'm not that surprised about, but still important to notice is that the, the top three threats were phishing, spoofing and ransomware. So, you know, that's kind of what, what I would have, would have expected to see. We see that in the B2B world as well. But the highlights there for me really are when we come to, um, talk about and, and implement and design a process around educating end users on, on, on good digital and cyber practice, 
well, let's prioritise where the top three threats are. You know, yes, password management is incredibly important. Um, absolutely, um, changing your Wi-Fi router at home is great tips, and we will move on to all of the kind of the the I suppose peripheral type good behaviours. But as a as a beginning point, let's get people doing good things behind the inbox. You know, the inbox can be a real kind of pot of destruction if it's not being used properly. So let's prioritise educating our end users on how to spot phishing emails, how to spot 365 or Google account takeover attempts, how to spot vouchers and things that are too good to be true that lead to downloads or file transfers from people you weren't expecting. Um, you know, let's focus our energy around, to begin with, inbox safety. And if we can get that bit right, then we're massively reducing that kind of threat to the, to, to the site. What was good is that general awareness and readiness um, for cyber attacks is up. And I, and I would say we're definitely seeing that. So we are seeing um, every year more schools invest further in cybersecurity technology. They invest further in training the people. There's a general kind of, I suppose, penny drop moment that, that we've got to do something about this. And there was a quote that, that, that I read a couple of days ago that I wanted to mention today. And it was some uh, uh, an industry professional was asked, you know, why have we seen a spike in edu and healthcare um, cyber attacks over the last few years? And, and their view, which kind of resonated really well with me, was the end users in, in doctors and hospitals and schools and colleges, they are wired to teach and to, and to care and to heal people. That is what they do. They are not cyber professionals. They don't kind of, you know, know what these cyber attacks look like. And why should we as people in cybersecurity and people in IT expect our end users to know what good password management looks like you know what phishing emails look like because if they're not told or not been shown then why would you know and i think for me there's a massive thing that you know teachers have a very focused narrow kind of um output and that is that we've got to train our students we've got to teach our students it's not oh is this a phishing email it's not oh am i recycling my passwords across web applications that's not how how they're generally built or or, or or work so we need to show them what good looks like without getting in the way of the day to day i thought that was hopefully one thing that if we take away from today is that actually our end users aren't us we get what good practice looks like. We get what good behaviours look like. But, you know, I can go and teach a class. That's not what I do. But I do know how to set and manage passwords and spot phishing emails. So how can we take a bit of a bit of our knowledge and kind of in a micro learning way, put it into our end users so they bring some of those habits to the table? I think that's really key. Um, and we've definitely seen on the final point, 55% of schools now running regular training and phishing testing so so more do it than than don't but this is a new thing you know probably two three years ago i would say maybe 35 40 percent every year we're seeing that percentage climb which is great people are getting the the the, the importance of educating our end users it's been around in business quite a bit longer um but we are starting to catch up in edu which is a really positive positive step now um Depending on the platform we're using, I would ask questions or in a poll here, but 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 for now I'm just going to ask a question. So what percentage of of cyber breaches are, are due to human error? And I'll give everyone a few seconds to to think about the answer. Okay, so some of you may have, have written it down or had a think, but but 95% of cyber breaches are due to human error. So what that means is there's a huge element of successful cyber attacks somebody's done something they shouldn't have done whether it was malicious which it probably wasn't by the way it was probably just an honest mistake but whether it's honest or dishonest the reality is something's happened that that usually at an inbox level or keyboard and mouse one of the biggest kind of risks to an organization um and the person at the end of it they've done something they shouldn't have done so what that's telling us is that we really need to yes have the technology layer that's stopping the email stopping the threats filtering out 99% of the attacks happening to the organization. They're stopped, they're forgotten, they don't even make the inbox, but it's the ones that slip that technology perimeter. The last line or the first line, depending on what way you look at it, is a person. So let's keep that in mind as we work through the, through the next few slides. And I think back to my point around um, how can we expect an end user to know what a sophisticated phishing email looks like if 
we've never shown them well well here's a good example so this is it's a couple of years old this one but it's um it's a royal mail one and i think it kind of hits the nail quite well so probably a bit small on the screen but from a branding perspective you know at a glance it's well branded the logo looks right the colors look right if we unpick a few other bits it's from hmrc so straight away i'm thinking oh wow why are they sending me something? We can all probably agree that it's not often good news if the HMRC is sending you things, unless you're a lucky person that's getting a tax rebate. But, you know, oh, a lot of emotion are tied to HMRC. Um, they're trying to bypass, I suppose, the human triage of, right, let's have a look. What's a telltale sign to just be like, right, emotive brand, urgent, Mr. Delivery attempt, you need to get to ASAP, reschedule it now input your credit card details to pay you quid or whatever it might be for a reschedule fee, bang, they've got your details. So these are the kind of emails that we're seeing doing the damage. It's not the, you know, you've inherited 12 million quid and if you give us 10,000, we'll send you the rest back. That that doesn't even come, you know, come across people's minds anymore. Or probably it won't even make the inbox. It's the stuff that slips the net where the branding's on point. There's lots of urgency and emotion, and they're trying to get you to bypass the checks that we would ask you to check. Um, so there's an example of of something that we've seen that's quite sophisticated. And I think when we come to running the simulated cyber attacks and we talk about those, then we need to be mirroring the ones that do the damage, the ones that, that actually lead to attacks, not, you know, the blast all type methodology. And here's another example that I like to show. This is a bit old, it's about a year old uh, now, but, but I think just from a creativity perspective, and again, you know, we're not in today's presentation thinking about us, we're thinking about our end users as the customer and, and I suppose the, the person we're trying to educate. So this is a, a, Amazon gift card, so a free voucher from Amazon. Amazon do not need to give away free vouchers. They're doing well enough without giving products away. And this was posted through people's um, people's letterbox. And you know the idea being, you scan a QR code to redeem your ten pounds. It will tell take you or likely take you to a website site that looks like Amazon probably. So. Amazon with an extra couple of O's or a few N's, but to a quick glance, you might not notice it. Ask you to log in with your Amazon to redeem your credit. Now, what we're probably thinking, well, how can that impact? How can that impact the school? What's that? So, yeah, we might get somebody to reveal their Amazon passwords, but, but what does that actually mean? Well, what that means is we can start thinking about sideways attacks. So um, I've revealed my Amazon login and password to, to the dark web by doing something like this. Well, there will be users in your organization that have a easy to remember password, maybe my you know, daughter's name and birthday with an exclamation mark that I think is really secure, but, but it's not revealed it. And it's the same one across my Gmail, my LinkedIn, my Office 365, my bank. You know, absolutely there will be users in every single school on this call today where they're sharing passwords. So by kind of a revealing on a fake Amazon page, not only can you potentially give away your Amazon you know, credentials and then they can go and buy things that we don't want them to be buying, you're actually sharing credentials that could be used for other systems that you're familiar to working with and that's how they gain access or, or another way of gaining access. So really important that, you know, if, if the education knowledge was there, look, if you get a gift card that's too good to be true, it probably is, you know, the spelling errors in this, for example, I can see them in the photo, you shouldn't be scanning that. That should go straight in the bin and forget about it. But people won't. People will scan it. Um, so they're the kind of things that we can educate. And it all started by just putting that in the bin, risk on. As soon as you scan it, input your credentials, you can build and build and build on that to what could lead to a Microsoft account takeover. Or it could be your finance director and they get in an inbox where there's all of the, you know, the invoice payments and things being approved and they just slip one in type thing. So so it often always starts with something as 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 basic and simple as that, and it can compound over time. So there's a couple of examples anyway that I think are, are quite useful to demonstrate. Um, but the good news is I'm a big believer there's a lot that can be done to reduce the risk. I also am a big believer that there's a lot that can be done quite quickly and without a ton of effort. Um, and, and it's like anything, 
you know, the box fish way, I'm not saying it's the best, it's the way that's worked really well for us. There's probably more intelligent ways, but we've come up with kind of a four step program of work that just helps to reduce that overall risk from end users and raise that awareness of what good cyber practices and, and kind of good, um, I suppose, digi- I call it the digital life. So what are your habits like in your digital life? And it is around identifying where that risk is. So running cyber attacks of different variations, different um, difficulty levels, different brands, personal life, work life to see where that risk sits. It's then about micro learning. So, you know, let's be honest, e-learning is not the top of everyone's agenda. And I say that running in theory an e-learning business, but but it but it's not. And I think we're better off accepting that it's not gonna be the top of the to-do list. So let's make it easy for the end user. You know, can they do it on any device? Can they log in? get it done within three and a half, four minutes a month. Can we make it really easy? So actually it's something right, I'm gonna get it done, I'm gonna pay my attention, but it's gonna be focused for three, four minutes and I'm gonna move on. You know, can we make it easy for the end user, friction free to go and learn the good habits? What can we do with the data that we're picking up? So obviously, you know, if particularly if you're kind of a mat or you've got multiple sites, you know, where does that risk sit across the, the board? Is it certain schools? Is it certain departments? Um, is it certain individuals? You know, we can peel back the onion to see where that risk sits within the organisation. And I think the fourth bit is one of the things that we, we've, we've seen people before they join Boxers really forget about. It's really easy to do a one-off or we do a 10 minute a year, 15 minute a year, whatever it might be, cyber training program. Great, doesn't work in my view, doesn't work. People forget things, it'll, it'll last for a couple of weeks, then people go back to their old ways. Whereas if you can just do micro learning regularly, you start seeing more of a behavior change. And that is absolutely fact based on, um, based on customer feedback and hundreds and hundreds of schools have moved into this micro regular model. Um, so that's the key. Identify, educate, report, rinse and repeat it. Keep it going. Make it part of the school's DNA. And there's some great assets on how how you can bring that all to the life, which I'll show in a moment. So that's the way. And we're going to break them down a little bit to actually kind of show what what they are. So part of... um, Well, let's wind it back a little bit. Before a cyber attack happens that causes damage, often there's research done. So it's not uncommon for cyber criminals to identify at the simplest level, are you a Google house or are you a Microsoft house? And I'm not talking about people that are spamming tons of emails. I'm talking about people that are targeting you. They are coming after you. They will research. They will find, are you Google? Are you Microsoft? What kind of applications are you using in the school to to run the school? Um, And then they will craft simulations or, or, sorry, real emails, phishing emails based on those applications. So what we look to do is we will kind of go through a similar exercise. So at point of onboarding, are you Google, are you Microsoft? Okay, we're Microsoft, great. So we need to tailor our simulations and simulated cyber attacks based on on Microsoft. So password resets, file shares, account takeover attempts. Let's mimic what you use because that's where the risk is. And then the other pot we use is uh, in terms of where the templates come from. What are we seeing in your vertical? So are we seeing, you know, lots of malware downloads coming in from um, vouchers or from logistic type emails? What brands are being impersonated in the UK that are going on and leading damage? Can we essentially flip the the real attacks into training material and get there before before the nasty people do? And that's been really useful to kind of build up this, we call it a journey. So let's say 12 months, but it can be, as frequent as, as you want or, or, or um, you know, the, the least I would recommend is one a term. Most most of our customers do one a month, but let's look at what that is, build it into a journey, how often we're going to do it, what kind of templates are we running, when do we want it to start, import users from AD or, or, or G Suite, hit go. And then without you having to worry about anything in the background, we're regularly testing your trainers, uh, your, your, your end users on running these simulated attacks. And in the early days, you know, sometimes people are a bit like, you know, uh, there's a bit of a phrase, I've been box fished again. And, you know, that's kind of what we want people to be thinking. We want them to be looking at, you know, just double checking emails. Is it a test from box fish? 
or actually is it just a real thing that we then report to IT or do we tell our mates about it because we're worried? So it's generally just raising the awareness of dodgy emails um, in, in kind of simple terms. And this is a really effective way of doing it. And then alongside that, what we want to be doing is, and I'm a big believer that um, if we're going to be testing people, we've got to train them. Some organizations um, in, our, in our vertical just do the testing. So they just run the simulations. But I think that's only half of it for me. If we're going to be testing people, we've got to show them what good looks like. And I think if anything, that's as important um, or, or even more so. So alongside the regular testing, you run micro learning and, and maybe we gamify it where possible, but four or five minutes a month, it's not even hour, an hour a year. And it's really key when we're positioning to this end user that we're saying we're investing in you. It's not workplace learning. This is skills for life. It's going to help keep you and your family safe and your place of work safe. So we're going to teach you how to spot phishing attacks. We're going to teach you how to not overly share on social media. We're going to teach you how to set, manage your passwords, things that we can carry on throughout our lives as good things to have. Um, and the key message is it's going to take you 45 minutes a year, but it's going to be three or four minutes every single month. And that's something that we, we plan out, we sink in. Again, similar to the journey, start date, frequency, import your users, hit go, and it runs in the background. And that's kind of the system level taking care of the attacks, the simulated attacks and the training. But, but for me, really, that's only half of it. So the customers that join us that think, right, we're going to buy the product, we're going to get our users and we're going to run some regular phishing and training, you get maybe 70% of the value. The real kind of icing on the cake is when you then start promoting it internally. So putting up posters, giving out themes, adding in bulletins, maybe IT team once or twice a year, do a sit down session as well. And it becomes kind of a multifaceted approach to reducing that risk. So yes, we can give you the tooling, but there is an element on, on, on the individuals in the organization to buy into the importance of this. And we've seen some really powerful um, output where where there's had the particularly the exec buy-in you know maybe the head sending out an email once a term to remind people of the importance of staying safe etc cetera, etc cetera. so i don't want people thinking you can buy a product like this plug it in and it solves everything you're going to get 70 ish maybe 80 percent of the way just with the tech but if you really want to get the maximum output of of reducing your risk in cyber you've got to buy into the technology that you're using to to do that Okay, so I'll show you a quick look at what these what these look like. So in terms of the identify bits of running a simulated attacks, um, I've got an example here of a, a just eat voucher. So not uncommon for the for brands to be impersonated like that. So you know these might appear at four or five o'clock on a Thursday night. Um, and what we're looking at doing is, you know, who's going to go and think, well, why have I been sent a just eat voucher to my school account as a starting point? You know, is it legitimate, um, et cetera, et cetera. We can then track who's willing to just go and, in essence, use the voucher. Who would go to a, a micro site, a spam site, um, input some credentials and hit download. And obviously we know that 70 odd percent of of uh, the, the malware viruses are from download. So, you know, these are the kind of things that can go and cause nasties. And it could be just eat voucher we're running. It could be a WeTransfer file share. It could be a OneDrive, loads of different options. But the key is we're identifying which of those users will click the email, input the credentials, and then go and down, download that. And of course, off the back of that data, we can then look at tweaking our training programs. So are we seeing users over here willing to go and download things from sites that they shouldn't be doing well if so let's stick them in a three four minute training course then retest them you know and put them through that journey of this is what you've done this is what you should have spotted let's go again um but in you know minutes of effort um we also have options around what we want to show the end user so sometimes our customers in the early days will just not tell uh, the, the end using team, end user team, sorry, that they're running these programs. They might just run 404s, file not found, oops pages. But to be able to kind of, um, I suppose, slip under the radar, you're not alerting people, you're not, you know, potentially upsetting people, but you're still gathering the data. And I think there's pros and cons of, of considering that, particularly in the early stages of the program. Um, and then we can move on to things like this, which I, I really like. So, so this is the ability where, 
if you click, it's an Amazon email, it's probably quite small, but but in a, an Amazon email on my screen there and then it will pop up and say, oops, you clicked something you shouldn't have. It was a it was a training exercise run by by um, by the IT team. Um, this is what you should have spotted. So when we come back to that kind of micro learning, in the moment, bang, these are the five or six things you've missed on the email you just engaged with that would have shown us that that's a phishing email. And it's not kind of four weeks later. It's not a bit like the email. It's exactly the email you've clicked and it's instant. So from an end user perspective, you know, you straight into quite a, oh, now I've clicked something I should have done. Let's have a look. And it's real in the moment kind of learning, I suppose, from from mistakes moving forward. So so that's been a really powerful um, a really powerful uh, uh, training tool, actually. Um, we've got LinkedIn invites. I'll come back on to. These are my favourite. Okay, so account takeovers for um, for Google and Microsoft 365 can cause all sorts of problems. And um, we, I've even heard reports, dare I say, and recently where people aren't allowed to turn on MFA because it's considered as an extra an extra barrier to getting access to stuff. And obviously no one in IT, you know, I know MFA is not the silver bullet, but it's certainly a good thing to have on if you haven't got it on. Um, and by running these kind of exercises, so essentially trying to get inside people's 365 or Google accounts via the same methods that a cyber criminal would, it can help justify investment in other areas of cyber. It can help reinforce the importance of MFA. Um, we don't capture people's passwords. I don't want to, definitely don't want to. We don't even see it. But what I can tell you is this user over here at six o'clock in the evening went to recover their account and revealed their username and password to the dark web if it was real. So we can then the next day, bang, account takeover training or an email to show what they should have spotted in the moment, really kind of strike while, it, while, while it's hot. Um, so they're, they're probably one of my favorites. I think running one or two of these account takeover attempts a year is a really good way of identifying a, a genuine attack on, on your organization. Um, and it will take a, a user to a page like this to log in, um, which we've all seen. So I'll keep going through conscious of, of time. So that's the first side of it, the identify, where's the risk coming from? Um, we've got loads of templates, you can build your own, but the idea being that we're looking at brands impersonated, key line of business applications, and real fish we're seeing in the inbox, essentially causing damage, turn it all into training material and get it out there in a safe, safe way. And then the next bit is around the education. So how can we get the habits and the good practices, you know, as we roll back, we're going to pretend that or, or our end users don't know what good passwords look like. They don't know how to manage them, don't know how to set them because they've never been told. So we're now going to move on to the bit around where, where we tell people. So um, we use, you know, quite relatively straightforward ways, but it works well. You know, we have two or three minute long, or oh, this one's four minutes, actually one of the longer ones, but animated video with a little game and a quiz. Um, we don't have a ton of jargon in there. It's, it's built for the UK Edu. It aligns to NCSC guidelines. This isn't good practice that we've come up with. You know, these are standard good behaviours that will set you up for a better way of working. Um, and they're delivered in, you know, a few minutes a month. So I'll just jump in. Uh, I'm going to kick this one. Hopefully the audio comes through. Um, to to I think it's a video on social engineering this one and basically the, the models that we work is we focus on one area per course so whether that's phishing to social engineering um, uh, passwords social media um, invoice fraud all sorts of different topics um, but then it focuses on one and it will explain what the threat is what you can do um, as an end user to avoid it and how it can go after you. So kind of a minute on each, really simple um, to follow, and then a little game at the end and a quiz. So I'll play just 30 seconds or so of this video now. Social engineering is a common technique used to gather confidential information. This can often be confused with phishing as it is also commonly conducted via email and can involve impersonation. The key difference is that social engineering attacks don't have to rely on malicious links or attachments instead using manipulative behavior to trick the target into sharing information. 
Ransomware is a type of attack that infects a target's device and encrypts the data stored within it, making all of the data and documents unusable. Ransomware authors will leave a message to the target, offering them the unique decryption code in return for a ransom payment. However, it is not unheard of for businesses to pay this ransom and still never... Sorry, I'll pause that there. Um, so, so, you know, they're, they're easy to watch, the lighthearted, just 30-second intro, but, but, you know, it's, it's, it's just enough without being too much to explain. You know, everyone will have heard of ransomware as a concept now. But what is it? So just, you know, why is it important? It can lock your network down. You've got to pay to get the code. OK, well, so I know what it is. More importantly, what can I do to avoid it falling for it, falling for a victim? Or if I think there's a risk of it, what's the right thing to do? And that's what the rest of kind of the video would, would, would move on to. Um, and I think one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, that yes, you can buy the technology and it gives you probably 70 to 80% of the value, but but the rest is actually really getting behind it more of almost like a bit like a marketing campaign. And and something that we've started doing more of is um, things like this. So we're working with um, schools on safer internet uh, days and things like that, where we actually include parents, we include students, we include you know um, uh, our end users, and it's things like pamphlets so we've got this is what's this one this is the parent edition so we've got you know stats on cyber quick easy tips to implement these can be printed off and you know given to to teachers to parents they can be left in foyers etc we've also got a student edition which obviously the the metrics and facts roll back to 10 to 16 year olds for example the tips on safety are relevant to to that demographic and it's little things like this that just kind of really complement the overall the overall technology delivery um, so you get kind of assets like that we've got the posters are really useful for kind of staff rooms um, student rooms etc again relevant to whether you're a student or, or a member of staff um, so you get all these great resources that if we get stakeholder buy-in really help raise awareness um, and I think one of the things that um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is we can't forget about our students. You know, they have a massive um, la landscape within our within, within our technology estate. And I think, um, yes, the risks they pose are probably slightly different, but f even from a safeguarding protection perspective, you know, social media is rife. We know the kind of nasties that exist in there. Cyberbullying is rife. So how can we include our students in this but maybe focus on the things relevant to them. So if we were to run, you know, a video on how to spot dodgy invoices to students, it's not going to resonate. But if we talk about cyberbullying, support available, setting and managing your social media profiles, they're the kind of things that we want to be doing. And we've got um, a series of animations that are actually recorded by, I think, a 15-year-old, um, 14 to 15-year-olds. Um, we're using brands that they refer to. We're using... Um, kind of wording and, and 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 websites and social media channels that they use so it all resonates really well so i'll just play an example of that for kind of 30 seconds although the internet does of course benefit our daily lives in many ways it also comes with a number of risks especially when it comes to our personal information in this video i will be talking through some of the risks that come with using the internet and social media as well as some top tips to help you stay safe. One of the things that worries me when using social media is the personal information that I might be sharing, often not being aware of the number of people outside of friends and family who are able to see it. To avoid your private details and photos falling into the wrong hands, keep these tips in mind. Social media profiles are set to public if you don't change them. I'll pause it, but I think we can all agree that um, that learning these kind of things early on in your in, in, in your life are only going to set you up for good practices. You know, as we get more dependent on technology, learning how to use it safely and securely is really key. So these little kind of trailers, four minute videos where we've seen this, and, and this, by the way, will be watched by hundreds of thousands of students this year uh, easily. And the, how we've often seen it deployed is actually we don't put the students on the portal, even as simple as big screen in an assembly where you've got everyone, once a term, watch one of them. Um, and, you know, just get people on that motion of thinking, 
oh, who is this stranger? Should I accept them? Or, you know, is the one person in your school that's maybe having a bit of a tough time online? And towards the end of this video, we talk about cyberbullying and the support available. You know, if it encourages one person to speak out, then it's done its job. So, so I really think, you know, don't just forget about, about the students when we're talking about the risk and, and the cyber practices. We're coming to the end now. Um, from a frictionless perspective, I don't need to go into a ton of detail here, but I talked about trying to make it easy. I think that's really key. So single sign-on, syncing into ADs, Googles, basically make it so an end user can go and take the training, get in and out within a handful of minutes a month is the goal, and then raise the awareness periodically with the posters, the simulated attacks. So it never really quite leaves the back, the, you know, the front of the mind. It never goes all the way back to that once a year. It's just there lingering around. Oh, is this an attack? Is this a simulation? Is it the real thing? Not sure. Best report it. That's kind of the behaviours we're looking to encourage. And then the final thing really is the, the the data. There's some great data on where the risks sit. So I love the league tables that are available, certainly from multi-site or, or MAT. So we know which school in my Academy Trust is, is the riskiest, which department in there, which individual user, and we can kind of treat, you know, use the data to 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 tailor the programs. And you know, it wouldn't be uncommon where we've seen like um specific users fall for nearly every simulated attack and it is sitting them down and saying look this is what you've done on these dates like unless you sort yourself out and get the training done and are more careful you know we're gonna have to start limiting your access and things so it just helps turn the lights on really of, of where that risk sits in, in the org um from an effort perspective you know it's like anything the more you put in the more you get out but you could you could run the technology for about half an hour a year with it all automated and running your cadences in the background and then i think 10 15 minutes a month just putting up you know the posters adding th the tips to the newsletters um, is all it takes it's a very little amount from an admin perspective and from a cost perspective you know i use the analogy of a cup of coffee like this isn't a big a big investment this is a few pounds a year per person um so, you know, it's given the, the, the threat that a successful cyber attack or data breach could cause to the organisation, spending that little bit of money and taking that little bit of time to really reduce it and help empower your users, I think, has a solid, solid ROI. And that's me done. Um, so thank you for, for joining. I hope it was it was useful and there's a few kind of nuggets taken away. Um, I've seen a couple of questions come in, but if there's any questions, stick them in and we can work through them. Yeah, thanks for taking that session, Nick. So we like you say, we have had a fair few questions come in. Um, so I'll just run through these. I mean, you have covered some of this in the content, but I think there's some value in, in covering off or recovering some of these bits. So um, so we've had one, um, how do you make sure uh, when people report issues, it's without blame or risk, so you can actually get to help sort problems. So I think people are noticing that, um, you know, uh, trigger phishing test emails, people are reporting it are then penalized in some way. Yeah, I think, I think it, it's all about how you position it. So, um, you know, in, and this is how not to position it, by the way. So there's companies in America that you can get fired for clicking simulated emails. That isn't what it's about. It's around the reaction to the individuals that have clicked it. So so this isn't, um, you know, you're going to get fired. You're going to get disciplinary. This is a part of training that's going to help us identify um, if you need extra support. So I think it's the way that you handle the users and the, the, even the wording that you use when you're positioning it. So when you talk about, we're going to start implementing this and this is why, even as simple things like, don't worry if you click one, this, you know, you're not going to get disciplinary action. This is to help us identify the risk. And I think it's all about how you follow up. Um, and even things like we've got the ability to customize the message. So we've got things like oopsie click something you shouldn't have as a standard one, but you could soften it down even further, you know, say, don't worry, this wasn't real, but hopefully next time we'll spot these things. So you can just choose the way you position it. And some people are very much on that scale. And then others are like, actually, no, um, you know, we really want to go in hard because ultimately you've, you've posed a risk. But I think, I think you can be too strong with it. 
and it, and position it early, position it that it's not disciplinary, it's a training method and it's going to help us keep you safe. And the final bit for me is always link it back to the personal life. You know, if you can say we are doing this to help you keep your family and your your yourself safe outside of work, because the threats and the things to spot the same, then that softens it down too. Perfect. Thank you, Nick. Um, so next question is, um, so how do you as Boxfish handle survey awareness or training fatigue with the users? Yeah, look, it's a really good question. I think um, I think the short and sharp helps. So um, these are four or five minutes long. So from a, you know, people are scarred from watching a 50 minute video on information security. You know, that's not this. It's four or five minutes a, a month. So, again, when we come back to the initial positioning of it, straight away, do not worry. This won't take you an hour a month. It's three to four minutes. Um, I think there's a lot to be said around maybe going every other month as well. So we're seeing quite a few schools um, where they do a simulation one month, a course the next, and a simulation and a course and so forth. So, you know, we're then talking four or five minutes every other month. So, it's 25 minutes a year in six bite sized modules. So I think trying to strike that balance of regular and often, but not causing fatigue is key. Yeah, no, perfect. Um, so we've got a few about, um, I suppose about more kind of what one of the questions was, um, what group is most likely to cause an incident? Is it teachers, pupils? Um, are there any stats on that available? Yeah. Um, it kind of, without avoiding the, the the question, it depends really. So, so we see finance targeted a lot, obviously, because they're handling payments. You know, particularly if there's, let's say, multi academy trust are going through um, adding additional schools into their into their trust. There's a lot of change and flux usually with new suppliers, the onboarding of things. So we see like kind of cyber criminals being dormant in these environments until there's change you know and that's when they strike so finance is always going to be, be key we see a lot of head impersonation as well so you know trustees on on the board being impersonated to get people you know um in other parts of the organization to do actions for them um so they're kind of probably the most serious ones come from um but in terms of a general risk i would say the teaching staff i think because they're not used to um, spotting these kind of attacks um, they're often in the middle of lessons you know it, they don't have a ton of time to just sit behind pcs and analyze things so so in terms of severity i would say finance and the, the exec team in terms of just general end users engaging with these it's usually teaching staff perfect so i actually had one um so uh, one of the people listening so they've seen attempts to compromise student accounts those yeah. student accounts have sent links to teachers or members of SLT to try and encourage the teacher or the member of SLT to click on it. Uh, and they've noticed, you know, any whiff of a safeguard and concern often overrides staff caution. Um, I suppose really the question is, does that or can that be incorporated in some of your training or or is it already? Yeah, so, so we, some some of our schools will run the simulations on, on the student accounts as well um, and will run training for students over and above kind of the you know the social media and the bullying and and, and the areas that i discussed so um it's down to personal preference that i think trying to get students to log in and sit a, a cyber training course is, has proved difficult i think where we've seen the better delivery is actually big screen, everyone in a room, and you can then choose what you want to display. So it could be kind of, you know, talking about what account takeovers look like. It could be cyberbullying, it could be social media. But the idea that we get all of the individuals in one go and we run it maybe once a term has been the best way we've seen to get uptake. And then you, you coincide that with the posters. So you could have, this is how you spot a phishing email. You put that A3 poster up in the, in the student rooms you know, in the hallways. And it's the little nudges that just help to 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 override that. No, that's great. But I think, I think there's also looking at, um, so is the training about maybe helping staff to notice uh, 
potential compromising emails from students. So where the student's account has been compromised, that student is then sending a link. So teachers are then looking out for potentially phishing attacks from student accounts. Yeah, um, sorry, maybe I've got a question, uh, misinterpreted the question, but yes, absolutely. So spotting um, account takeover attempts, whether it's from a senior exec or a student, the, the telltale sounds very similar. You know, wording will be different to what you expect. You know, there's usually a, a bit more emotion to try click something or download something. The telltale, the, the great thing about this is the telltale signs are always, nearly always consistent. So whether it's your, your Gmail at home, your 365 account at work, whether it's your exec impersonation or a student, the two or three things to spot pretty much always the same. Perfect. Um, so the next one is, uh, is there any way to block user logins for any other method than Microsoft or Google single sign on? Is there any, uh, as in, so a user can't set and manage a password? I, I think if I've understood this correctly, so you can't log into Boxfish without Microsoft or, or Google, or do they mean across general web applications? Uh, yeah, no, I think your first interpretation, that's that's how I've read it. Yeah, so we can hide username and password. And I mean, to be honest, I hate usernames and passwords. So um, uh, yeah, it, you can hide that on the login. Uh, so it would be Microsoft and, and Google single sign-on. And that that's the way to go for, for web apps is, you know, set your policies correctly at Microsoft and Google level and then publish SSO. Um, so yeah, that's perfect. Um, so again, one is more about what things that you might be seeing. So um, are you seeing where fishers are starting to impersonate phishing testers? So a scenario would be a user clicks on a real phishing email, gets a you clicks on a phishing training email, advises the user not to report it. Um, you know, we already know screen. Is that something that that users have reported yeah, seeing? Yeah, 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 yeah. We we have seen we have seen it. One of the big, uh, big, big American companies that have had that. Um, I think absolutely. So yes, um, there's always they're so creative and, and crafty that they will try anything possible. So yes, we have there's things that we do to obviously reduce that risk around um, the ability to stop people spoofing domains and things. But ultimately, if you you know, that is efficient itself. So I think the things to spot would help give that away. So has it come from the sender that usually sends us phishing emails, if in doubt, speak with IT. So we absolutely have seen stuff like that. It does exist. Um, but if you wind back to doing the right things, then you probably wouldn't fall for it for it anyway, or hopefully wouldn't. That's fine. And there was a question earlier on. I, I think I answered it in the chat, but just in case not, I think on your second or first or second slide, there was um, one of your statistics. I think it was 83% um, of, uh, you know, I'll just pull it back up. I think it was 83% mm -hmm. of um, schools have reported a breach. Um, so I, I believe the source link to that is from the NCSC. Um, it was just to clarify whether that was the case. I, I kind I've of did a quick search on them. I've got a references page. It's probably it'd be NCSC, Gartner, or maybe Veronis did a big study as well into cyber attacks and edu. So I'd have to double check, but it, but it will be credible. It'll either be Veronis, Gartner, or NCSC. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, and um, I'll just see. I think there was there's also been a clarity. So the clarification. So the um, uh, the question that we're, you know is there any way to block user logins for any other method than the microsoft or google single sign-on um so it was a reference to across general web applications oh okay um i don't know if you can enforce it actually um i don't know i i, I don't know the, i wouldn't want to answer that for i don't know you can obviously encourage it in your communication and our training encourages that for sure but I, I don't know if you can enforce it. Perfect. Sorry, sorry, okay. David, I don't know. <laughs> well, look, maybe I can respond to once the, the video is on there, you know, we can um, maybe get a, a bigger uh, response to that perhaps online. Um, so I haven't seen any other questions come through. Um, I can just leave it a minute. Um, so for those, I mean, anyone that is listening, anyone that is looking, 
back into a 10 bet this year. So Boxfish are going to be looking to be on the, the net control stand at bet. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to see some of the training sessions in real life, coming down to our stand and we'll certainly have it. Again, if you have any questions about the solution, about Boxfish, please let us know. You can obviously contact through the net control account, uh, through the website. Um, you can email me direct at josh.moore at netcontrol.com. Um, you know, we've got some really, really good one-on-one -on -one demos. Um, you, you know, we've had a lot of interest in Boxfish products and, um, yeah, you know, I, I'm not too surprised why it's been a great, it's been a great product for us the last, uh, the last 12 months or so. Um, so like, I don't think I've seen any other questions come in, Nick. So I think, um, I think with that, we'll, we'll close the session then. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you everybody. Really appreciate you joining and thanks uh, Edge Geek and Net Control for hosting. Hope it's been useful. Yeah. Thanks everyone. And that wraps it up for today's webinar. I'd like to thank Nick, Josh and Kieran very much for joining us today. It's been a really informative talk and I'm sure everyone got a lot out of it.